we come across discoveries of maybe very, very old murtis or vigrahas, or the excavation of the remains of yogis in the same pose that was found on the Pashupat Sea of the Harappan civilization. This rejuvenated interest in India's past and its history and its inexhaustible resource of knowledge is a very, very cheering thing. The proof of India's past lies in its large body of intellectual texts, its collection of manuscripts, its textual tradition, and thinkers, schools in so many domains and knowledge. We are here to talk about Professor Mahadevan's book, Introduction to Indian Knowledge Systems, Concepts, and Applications. This book is in four parts. The part one gives us an overview of the Indian knowledge systems. Part two tells us about the fundamental concepts of science and technology. Part three talks about science, engineering, and technology in Indian knowledge systems, or IAS. Part four is reserved for the humanities. Now, this book was developed as a textbook for the All India Council of Technical Education. And it was a Bhagirath Taj indeed, which Professor Mahadevan and his co-authors accomplished in a remarkably short period of time. Professor Mahadevan himself, a very wise and erudite person, is a professor of operations management at IIM Bangalore, with more than 27 years of experience in teaching, research, writing, not only at the IIM Bangalore, his alma mater, but also at IIT Delhi and XLRI Jamshedpur. He was a visiting scholar at the Amos Tuck School of Business Administration, Dartmouth College, New Hampshire. He was also a retainer consultant to Deloitte USA. He was earlier chief editor of the IIM Bangalore Management Review. Professor Mahadevan, sir, welcome to Sangam Talks. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rinkoji. It's my pleasure to join you in today's conversation. Thank you. Professor Mahadevan, I would like to ask you so many questions mm -hmm. that have been going on in the minds of our viewers, the readers of your books, this book in particular that I have read through and through and have found immense joy in reading so much that you have filled, the knowledge that you have filled in this one book, which would be appropriately called Gagar Me Sagar Dharna. So my first question is, how did this book come into being? What was the inspiration? And uh, can you recount the journey for us? Yes. So I think uh, this whole uh, journey started, I must say, of course, uh, it has started 30 years back. That's a different story. But in a more focused way, if I have to think through, I think the journey started around 2015 when uh, Chinmaya Mission started, uh, wanted to start a new university. And uh, the idea of the university was to somehow blend uh, Indic knowledge with the modern knowledge, you know, to use uh, Gurudev uh, Chinmayananda's own words. It's like saying connect the East and the West or uh, science and spirituality. These kinds of words Gurudev used to you know, often sort of mention. So I agreed to be the founding vice chancellor of this university. That's when I think the journey in a very serious note started. And as part of the university, I myself designed a two-part course of six credits Indian Knowledge System 1 and Indian Knowledge System 2, uh, way back in 2015-16, which we thought every student in the university will have to go through. So honestly, that's where uh, the thoughts which have been ruminating for the last 30 years started gathering a little more focus. And when I myself taught that course along with my two other co-authors in the university, I think there was a lot of understanding of what uh, we should be doing uh, and it was our desire we should write a book also one day. But that had to wait till 2019 until one day I received a call from AICT chairman and said, why don't you write a book on Indian knowledge systems because we have introduced it as a required course in uh, uh, the engineering colleges. We don't seem to have a book. So uh, what was waiting uh, there was a platform to sort of uh, put our thoughts together. So 
sometime in 2020 i actually wrote a letter to the then uh, minister of education saying uh, how important it is to have a textbook to formally teach indian knowledge systems and uh, i in my own way said that i would be happy to write a book but i need a little kind of a support in terms of uh, recruiting a few people to sort of uh, you know collect material and so on which the minister very immediately replied with a big support saying i support this project and please go ahead acd would uh, sort of uh, be the agency with whom you will work and get this this happened in 2020 march little i knew that we will have a shutdown <laughs> after we decided to start the project we wanted to have the first meeting but the whole country was shut down so then the journey started in a very solitary fashion we had to sit at home and find out how to look for material and uh, fortunately all material which are you know 1000 years old are available either in archives or somewhere or in some libraries and so on so we could download a lot of material but we have to sit all by ourselves and read it and anyway in a matter of about 14 months we could uh, give a shape to this whole idea in a bit by bit we wrote and finally you see the book in front of you so i think that's how i would say the journey started and proceeded that was a mammoth task indeed professor madhavan to condense all this in such a short period of time so the next thing that i wanted to ask you is that we are uh, confronted with two terms there is indian knowledge systems and there is indian knowledge traditions so what is the difference between the two okay so this is a very good question because uh, you know some people use uh, indian knowledge tradition as you say some people use the word indian knowledge system and so on so let me little bit define iks which would partly answer the question that you are asking when we actually set on this journey obviously if you have to write a book on indian knowledge system it's very important that we first define it otherwise you know it's going to be a bit of an issue a problem for people to comprehend in a, in a certain way so as you see here there are three terms here indian knowledge and system so first of all we said uh, when you say indian we had two important considerations in our mind the first thing is uh, it is anything to do with akhand bharat not the political formation after 1947 because that's only a, a convenient thing that happened 75 years back so moment to say indian our understanding was it could have it could be that body of knowledge that we have synthesized right from kandahar afghanistan on one side to even far east on the other side and of course it runs from the himalayas to the you know setu and uh, you know the cape comorin and so on so first indian means akhand bharat the second definition of indian which we took to ourselves after reading a bit of uh, different words we realized all those who have lived in this country for a substantive point of time period of time have imbibed the culture have lived through it and only such works we call it as indian because there are quite a few foreigners who have picked up the book done their own translation in all the genuinity but what we realize is unless you are part of the culture sometime you may miss out things so that's another scoping so these are the two things about indian then comes the knowledge that's where your question comes in terms of what the difference between a tradition and a system so what we realized is moment you say knowledge knowledge is always uh, you know implicit it's not tacit knowledge is always implicit it, it happens in somebody's mind there is a reflection there is a synthesis there is a certain kind of uh, you know internalization all that happens knowledge in pure form is always uh, you know tacit but then when it gets explicit it gets into two forms one is in a literary form you know where it can be documented uh, even in a oral form or uh, you know in a form of a palm leaf scripts or in today's terms we have a proper literary books and uh, literature and so on so that's one kind of a, a component of knowledge but there's a second kind of a component of knowledge which is hugely oral which is hugely in terms of practices it is uh, uh, very very much part of the society you know you have rich health tradition for example 
you have art forms, you have certain unique practices. All these are not written down, but they are also knowledge at the end of the day. So therefore, if you ask me, what is Indian knowledge system and Indian knowledge tradition? Things which can be managed in a sort of a literary kind of a framework can be broadly called as a knowledge system because you know one can still put it in a structured way, look at it, and all that kind of things. Whereas the larger scheme of knowledge, which are tacit, which are passed on by practices and oral traditions and so on, that is knowledge tradition. So knowledge tradition is much larger. Knowledge system can be a, a part of it, which is in a, I would say, in a structured, uh, you know, literary kind of a framework. And then the system part, the third definition is the system part. So what we mean by system, at least for the purpose of the book, is a way by which you can very nicely organize it. You know, the knowledge is so vast. You have to put it in a, in, a, in a way which is easily comprehensible, which is exhaustive in its own way, it is interconnected in a, in a structured way and so on. So that is what I call it a system. So uh, that's how perhaps I will define an Indian knowledge system and the Indian knowledge tradition. So Professor Mahathivan, can we say that the system is inherent in the tradition? Absolutely. Yeah. A certain abstraction of the tradition in a more formal sense could be thought of as a system. That's one way we look at it. Which brings us to our next question, Professor Mahadevan, that in a country which had a flourishing writing tradition, I mean, we have evidence of script from Mohenjo-Daro and we have Ashokan edicts in three different scripts, Haroshti, Brahmi and proto Brahmi. Why did we lay so much emphasis on the oral tradition? Okay. And why this mnemonic culture, as we call it, the cultures of memory? Yes. So uh, these two are interrelated in some ways. First of all, our, uh, our journey with formal scripts, uh, whether it is Brahmi or whether it is Prakrit or Samskrit, Samskrit is 2500, 2700 years. Panini, if you take it as an approximate sort of a reference, then we are talking of 400 BC, so 2500, 2600 years. The very fact that this civilization is very old, 2500 is too young, in a way, if you think of it, in some ways, for a tradition of ours, like any other, even even Egyptian tradition, to an extent Chinese tradition, and so on. So when you have a tradition which is much, much, uh, you know, older, clearly, there is a great amount of oral tradition. The literary tradition has been a very later addition. Even that itself looks much longer for us. So therefore, I think uh, we were essentially a oral tradition. Now, if you take uh, oral tradition as given, then there are certain very important rules. The first, I have talked about it in chapter one of my book also. So it was the end of the chapter one. Point is, moment you sort of drive your entire knowledge system in a oral uh, kind of a format, the name of the game is being concise. See, you can't, today you can write a you know, thousand page book on uh, how to handle the left eye, another thousand page book on how to handle the right eye. You can write a separate book for uh, chemistry. I mean, all those are in a, in a system where you put it in a piece of paper and keep it, size is not an issue. Moment it is oral, the name of the game is being concise because that's the most efficient way of uh, transmitting, absorbing, retaining, and so on. Therefore, uh, <clears throat> mnemonics are very, very important. And uh, they capture it uh, so beautifully well. And we are able to retain. I'll just give you an example. There is a beautiful mnemonic in Chandra Shastra. Chandra Shastra is second century BC. The whole idea of prosody, you know, how do you create uh, padas and padyas and uh, how do you create the poetry and so on. So there is a nice mnemonic which comes out of uh, what Pingala has done. It is not Pingala's mnemonic, but out of Pingala's work, there is a mnemonic called Yamata Rajabana Salagam. It is an eight letter actually, ten letters. And if people understand, remember that, then much of what he said about the eight ganas that he defined as part of Chandra Shastra is available in this simple mnemonic. So therefore, I think uh, uh, being concise is extremely important. 
and uh, therefore uh, mnemonics uh, you know uh, doing things uh, and the second implication of this i forgot to mention is you cannot write a book for spirituality another book for religion another book for day to day applications uh, everything will be in one word because it is all oral it all depends on how do you want to dip into it uh, because yeah. con- being concise is the name of the game that's why you find indian knowledge tradition also is always multi dimensional actually right which brings me to uh, the next question professor madhavan that we have so much knowledge this wealth of knowledge which is in the itihasa tradition which conveys and which also branches off into various domains of knowledge it contains information about sankhya maybe mimamsa in its various forms so what is the role of all that knowledge for the modern context okay. for the modern indian student yes so let me first of all trace all these uh, you mentioned itihasa darshanas and so on let me first trace all these see if you look at the corpus of the indian knowledge which has come down as i told you initially in a oral sort of a framework and then we got into a bit of scripts and writing and so on but if you look at the entire corpus they have all flown from the vedic corpus our root of our entire knowledge stems from the vedic corpus which we call the shruti that which is heard okay so you, here is a culture this culture is uh, we call it as sanatana dharma is shruti pramana the pramana is shruti the the core evidence for us to establish anything that you want to establish whether it is a day to day life issue or whether it is a philosophical issue or whether it's a religious issue whatever you call it is the corpus called vedic corpus no so therefore now you need to derive all these that are required from the vedic corpus owing allegiance to the vedic corpus that's how the next broad set of you know ideas came for example you have uh, puranas we have ashtadasha puranas ashtadasha upapuranas and so on they have actually drawn the basic principles laid out in the vedic corpus but then they have demonstrated it by way of uh, how people lived how perhaps one can live what we can do in fact uh, these puranas are encyclopedic vishnu dharmotra purana you will find how how do you do a painting how do you prepare a wall for painting you will find a lot of things on agriculture puranas actually portrayed how people lived what issues they actually faced in shrimad bhagavata purana there is a complete description of the fetus from first day of this uh, you know uh, embryo and the uh, thing being developed up to 20 weeks so beautifully described in the third kanda and so on. so puranas are very encyclopedic they explained everything as people saw it and so on then itihasas also were similar to that then you had darshanas where it addressed the question of people wanted to know who am i where have i come from and where am i going i don't think we can run away from that question whatever be the technology that we may have so you know darshana has picked up all that again from the vedic corpus and came proposed uh, alternate ways of understanding it <clears throat> then came a vast body of knowledge on mathematics on uh, aesthetics on uh, agriculture or astronomy they all actually drew again from they owe allegiance to the vedic corpus they expanded it added their understanding and then improvised it and so on and so forth so this is how this entire knowledge has flown and therefore uh, if you ask are they relevant today of course they are very relevant today because uh, uh, the basic idea is uh, human beings have problems to solve the problems are problems of day to day living problems of existential nature problems of uh, interpersonal problems of uh, you know uh, what you may call it as uh, philosophical in nature sociological in nature let me give one example sometimes it doesn't really go well in chapter 3 of bhagavad gita which is part of mahabharat which is uh, you know an itihasa it is in shanti parva so in chapter 3 of Mah- bhagavad gita there is a beautiful question which arjuna asks the question is atakena prayuktoyam papam charati purushah anichana api varshneya baladiva niyojitah it's a beautiful question he says baladiva niyojitah i have been pushed into a victim of situation anichana api i didn't want to see we experience it many times in our life you know in the office 
you and i are such a you know nice colleagues respect each other but on in on a day in a particular meeting we pick up an argument and then i overstep and maybe i am a little disrespectful to you or something like that or vice versa i come back home this question comes to me can a prayta who made me to behave like this so these kind of questions are very real it's it's a question of sociality it's a question of interpersonal behavior so these kinds of issues are up plenty in the indian knowledge systems and so therefore they are very relevant if we are able to dip it uh, deep and then analyze some of these and of course krishna answers why it happens he talks about a bit of psychology and all that so this is an example which i gave you mr martin i would like to ask you something about your teaching of the bhagavad gita in the classroom but before that i have another question which is related to the courseware that this book that you have created addresses the undergraduate and perhaps the post graduate classrooms also so is there a way in which we can also percolate or begin this education rather early in the schools we know that these two books of knowledge of traditions and practices of india already exists so these ncert books are there for classes 11th and 12th do you think it is relevant to start teaching these aspects of our culture and tradition from an earlier age okay. do you think a child's mind is mature enough yes to understand well, so uh, if you had uh, uh, dr rinku if you had uh, carefully looked at the national education policy nep 2020 now uh, the central theme in nep 2020 if you really look at is it says we have come to a stage in looking at our educational system we have done a lot of interesting things uh, after independence in the last 70 years clearly but uh, uh, nep somehow alludes to this fact that somewhere maybe the central theme of the educational system and when it says educational system it starts with early early childhood education then the primary school middle school and of course higher and adult education and so on so what it clearly says is uh, we may have to aspire for what is called rootedness in india this is the issue that uh, they really ask rootedness in india is a very very important requirement of this uh, educational paradigm that we may have to do so essentially what it means is i think uh, we need to start uh, as soon as the child is ready to get into a formal educational framework i think we need to imbibe the culture and the traditional and the knowledge practices and the indian knowledge system and you may be happy to know that uh, uh, you know uh, in, in our country we keep re, you know revising this curriculum framework uh, that's a regular practice that we do the last revision happened in 2005 and consequent to this nep 2020 there is a massive exercise that is going on now to completely revise the national curriculum framework it's called the ncf national curriculum framework the ex isro chairman uh, dr kasturangan is heading this whole initiative manjul bargo and all these people are part of it so there there is there are 25 national focus groups they have created to address how do we look at uh, the rootedness in india and the culture and so on and how do you you know uh, make uh, this uh, curriculum up to date with that and one of the focus groups group is knowledge of india so what you say is very much uh, uh, in the pipeline i am been part of it and we have thought through this issue and we have been in the process of writing a position paper which will drive uh, how we can make this transformation that you are talking about oh uh, will be people to read these position papers any time soon professor mahadevan because yes, they are very interesting and read i think so i think very soon the position paper would be out in the public domain because uh, it's very important that uh, we all are able to even react to these position papers and offer our suggestions and so on i think it will be where i may not know but i think within a couple of months it should be out in the public domain i think professor so, madhavan uh, let's come back to the material culture of our past now we see very fine specimens of metallurgy in the delhi iron pillar the dhar pillar which have not rusted over these past so many hundred years you have cited the example of wood steel which i would like you to share with our audience today and its importance okay so uh, of the many different areas 
in which uh, we have made very interesting, very useful contributions. One of uh, there are two areas which are very shining according to me. One is mathematics slash astronomy. That's one area, and the other area is metal working technologies. Indians have been absolutely fabulous in these two areas. At, at least the way I have understood with the, my limited knowledge of reading some of the texts which are two thousand years old and thousand five hundred years old and so on. So let's talk about metal working technology. When you say metal working technology, Indians were I don't know how many of you read yesterday or day before in Uttar Pradesh they have uh, actually unearthed some uh, copper. Uh, you know artifacts and you know utensils and swords and so on which is 3000 years old you know those kinds of things anyway so this wood steel so uh, one area where indians have delivered so well is what is called ferrous carbon alloy steel is actually uh, an alloy of uh, iron and carbon so you know in metallurgy terms it is called ferrous carbon alloy and indians have been absolutely fabulous in creating this alloy of ferrous and carbon one of them is called wood steel as westerners call it as wood steel this wood steel was manufactured in uh, karnataka kerala tamil nadu area you know salem uh, some adjoining areas of erode and all that in modern day tamil nadu and so on and we have extensive uh, records to show how the pandya and the chera kings have been exporting these from kodungallur port which is the western part of you know in kerala which has been a big uh, maritime route for us to you know rome to the middle east and so on and this wood steel is used for manufacturing what is called damascus blades you know war time at that time were all huge swords which are very sharp and so on they use wood steel for actually making damascus blades and the name woods came from you know it is in kannada it is called ukku and in tamil it is called eggu so the eggu and ukku becomes woods you know it's easy for them to pronounce and so on so that's how the wood steel is and what i understand is as late as 1960s i've been reading somewhere that uh, the modern day material science and metallurgy people are still trying hard to somehow replicate the composition of wood steel which they have not succeeded so this is a the great legacy about wood steel but to tell you the sad story of wood steel by a 1900 1800 it came to a grinding halt simply because uh, britishers imposed a mining ban they imposed a production tax so it is uneconomical to extract uh, and do something instead of that you take the ore and send it to british they'll convert it into useful products put five times the tax and sell it back to us so that's how india's uh, global trade from 25% of the world global trade in 1700 we came down to 1 and 1/2% in 1970 so uh, you know any that's a that's a different story so we we lost all these legacy because we just lost it because of certain colonization world. was one major factor which set us back so many years but uh, did it not survive even in the smallest pockets somewhere among some jatis no it is it is all been so the point is uh, dr rinku is uh, this has been now reduced to a very localized uh, yeah few people here and there even that trade is fast disappearing because it has been by and large transmitted uh, in a oral sense it's a guru shishya parampara this country had a great culture of guru shishya parampara so metal smiths had a guru and then they had a shishya quite often they were uh, family members and it was sons and cousins and uncles and those kinds of things that was the charm of the caste system caste system was not bad it was a group of people who specialized uh, in something and then they perpetuated that trade so that's how the castes were aligned britishers gave a different uh, meaning to the caste and they were able to take the other part of the caste and then throw it out and so on so all these nice people are now sitting in front of a computer and doing some you know c++ programming and so on instead of uh, you know doing these nice things we seem to be losing most of it and there is a certain shame attached to these trades now which never existed earlier in our memory or even our history which is a really really disappointing thing 
and that is why a lot of students prefer not to take up their heritage occupations and prefer to get into education or maybe earn a degree which may not give them a lot because there's in so fact, many others with the same degree in fact uh, uh, mr dharampal had written a five volumes you know volume 2 i think is science and technology in india in 18th century volume 4 is about the beautiful tree the educational system that he found all these were what happened in the 18th century well researched lot of data with which he has written so essentially when you look at that what you really see is exactly what you are saying dr rinko what has happened is the new education system looked at looked down upon all these colored it in a particular way also put incentive mechanisms in a particular way after all we are all very very ordinary people dr rinko we need to have our three days meal three me three meals a day so the government is pushing us through its policy formulations that we have to get elsewhere we will get elsewhere because at the end of the day i, I it, it is my livelihood so therefore we abandon the trade because the government forced us to take an education which was introduced in 1813 which we are continuing even today and that uh, look the other way it said all these are nonsense let's look at the other way and then bring what uh, is important to us so you know all these has happened because of that so we shame our own legacy because that's how we have been sort of thought which brings me to another question professor mahadevan which is a bad question when we say that does art have utilitarian value so in the same way i'm going to ask does indian knowledge system have any economic value in present day so does it bring you know revenue to the country does it bring employment to the people okay so i'll How i'll i will answer it in two three levels you know this question people have asked me for quite some time for quite some time they ask will it feed the masses will indian knowledge system feed the masses then i tell them definitely not that they get very surprised i am giving an answer like this and immediately i tell them that uh, 200 million satellite which isro is putting on the orbit will not feed the masses directly it will only feed the masses indirectly because let's talk about an insat uh, a satellite which looks at our weather you know in the last 20 years when we put those satellites people could have easily said that uh, you know why are we spending these 200 million dollars on a fancy piece of uh, Uh, a technology piece which is uh, you know rotating somewhere uh, but what happens is because we put it there we were able to uh, you know create a lot of secondary technologies out of it which started feeding the masses so my first answer is indian knowledge system is like this 300 million satellite you have to first put that in the orbit because that will generate a whole lot of uh, secondary knowledge and that will definitely create flourish a trade create jobs and all that this is point number 1 point number 2 let me let me be more specific no we are now living we are actually transitioning from a military power to a knowledge power i am i am very sure in the next 50 years the the strength of a nation is measured not just by how many missiles we have what kind of uh, defense deter- deterrence we have which is very important but we will be measured on what is called what is our share to the patent framework world intellectual property organization is deciding who will get patent on what and it is not a distant past for many of us we lost the patent on turmeric neem we lost the patent on neem but we fought the patent on turmeric and basmati for 20 years finally we reclaimed it where did it come from it came from our extensive digging up of our indian knowledge system if you don't read our indian knowledge system we will massively lose on the world intellectual property organization fight that we will have to fight so even from that perspective you see i always used to think a professor of chemistry a researcher of chemistry much must must read that portions of ikas a metallurgist must read that portion of ikas a management guru must read that portion of ikas otherwise we might even so there is a huge economic value and the value is because in patent as many of us know our ability to say i knew earlier than you suppose i can establish i knew earlier than you the patent has to be delivered to me not to you 
and we are finding it very difficult. Dr. Mashlekar, when he was the Director General of CSAR, really put a lot of effort to inculcate this idea. Let us look at IKs very seriously because there lies our, uh, you know, it's a gold mine on which we are sitting in this uh, future of world intellectual property argument. So even if you look at it from that perspective, IKs has huge economic value waiting to be tapped. Which also begets the question, Professor Mahadevan, that IKS is soft power as we see it. So does this soft power really enable us to emerge as a maybe a potential superpower in addition to the other military and other kind of powers that we are developing these days? So what role does IKS play in the overall component of power that a country rides on? Yeah, so put it in one sentence, if I, if I may. If we can really dig into IK, if you ask me, do we have all the answers? I don't, I don't think. All that I'm saying is uh, my simple understanding of strategy. I'm a professor of management. My simple understanding of strategy tells me that the path you travel is a function of the path you have already traveled. So the path, in fact, uh, so this is what uh, C.K. Prahalad and these great management gurus talked about what is called core competence. This is a very specified uh, you know, theory in strategy, so I'm not getting it there. All that I would like to say is, uh, I think uh, this soft power called IKS is the path that we have traveled. And our ability to travel forward with all our strength and mind is a function of understanding this path so well. It's very, very important. So therefore, I think this soft power will manifest very beautifully if we are able to go back. We have lost about 150 years. That's okay. You know, in a, in a civilization which is running to several millennia, 150 years is nothing. It is like a speck of a dust. You and I may be at a, you know, not see many of those, but that's okay. I am not so much bothered about it. I think it, we are in a continuum. Therefore, to step back a little bit and again revisit all these, will only make us, uh, you know, uh, 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 Vishwa Guru once again. And I think that's where lies our ability to look at it with a lot of Shraddha and a lot of seriousness, actually. Professor Mahadevan, a lot of our texts, in fact, most of our texts are in Sanskrit. And how does one approach these texts if one has to learn from them through translations or through learning the language itself? And how can this language be used in contemporary times? We read of natural language processing, we read of computational linguistics, which are using Sanskrit anyway. So how does one approach Sanskrit, a beginner way? Okay, first of all, it was it's very unfortunate we do our, both are conversing in English, because that seems to be the only linked language for us today. You know, my, 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 my frequent example, is Shankaracharya is, if I use today's terms, Shankaracharya is a Malayali, Ramanujacharya is a Tamilian, Madhavacharya is a Kannadiga, but all the three of them use a link language called Sanskrit to, you know, transact, to communicate as much as we use English today. Okay. I was in uh, Iran for about three months, about 15 years back. And I went there to finish writing a book. I thought I may be less disturbed and therefore it's a good idea to go and stay there and so on. I also taught a PhD level course there. For the first time in my life, I spent three months of Maunavrata because nobody understood English. I could not converse with anybody in Iran. I was sitting in one corner and then doing my book writing and I go and teach English in the class. So English for them is like Sanskrit for most of us. You and I can't, uh, you know, speak in Sanskrit. I mean, I can speak a little bit in Sanskrit, maybe, uh, but many of us are, are not capable. But we can sort of understand, we can look at a commentary and see. So we have relegated this language to that level. And we have replaced it with English and so on. But unfortunately or fortunately, whichever way you look at it, the wealth of our thinking, Sanskrit was an official language. Sanskrit was uh, like English today. You know, at home, you speak your mother tongue with your kids and your grandmother and your parents. You don't speak in English. Very rarely we use English words also. But then we, we do Vyavahara in our Matru Bharsha. Whereas in, in the office, we speak in English. So Sanskrit was like that. So Sanskrit can be potentially a language for intellectual analysis, intellectual, you know, sort of 
inquiry, research. Why not? We can do that. Now, uh, that is very, very important. Otherwise, translated words have their own uh, difficulties. To give you a very simple example, whatever is your mother tongue, take that joke in mother tongue and tell it in English. People, instead of laughing, they will cry. Because you know, language preserves and a word has a very unique meaning. It has a certain connotation and so on. Therefore, I think Sanskrit is very important. And learning Sanskrit, somehow we are told is difficult. I am telling you, Sanskrit is the easiest language I have seen in my life. If we are logical, which most of us are, if you are basically a very logical person, then of the several languages, the easiest language to pick is actually Sanskrit. It's hugely logical. It's hugely structured. And that is why they are saying natural language processing, Sanskrit can be a very potential uh, enabler of that. There is a lot of research which is going on. We have covered a lot of ground and so on. So I think uh, very quickly you can get back to Sanskrit. It's not difficult. 40% of the vocabulary, even my mother tongue is Tamil. But 40% of my vocabulary is actually Sanskrit. So it is not too difficult. We can very easily sort of uh, get into the language and we will open the gold mine of knowledge and then we will be able to really you know, draw very much from all these. Okay. Uh, Madhavan, I would like to bring us to your teaching uh, classroom once again. And uh, you teach the Bhagavad Gita also to your students. In what manner have you kind of designed your lessons and what techniques do you use to teach this very, oh. very erudite text? Oh. Because oh. it is not very easy to understand and approach without a teacher. Quite clearly. Okay. okay, so for the last uh, 10 years, uh, I have been teaching a course in IAM Bangalore. And the course is uh, entitled uh, Management Paradigms from Bhagavad Gita. So when I introduced it in 2012-2013, uh, out of the demand from my students, because I've been informally sort of lecturing to them, and they said, sir, you must bring it as a proper elective. It's a, it's a regular three-credit elective course which competes with the best electives in the institute. We have a free market bidding system and so on. So this course, 150 students at least take this course every year. Now, the interesting part about this course is uh, the, the whole charm of this course is this course starts from the problem that we face and then peep into Bhagavad Gita to find out whether it has solution to these problems. See, many a time what we do is we teach Bhagavad Gita and let the students find out how do you connect it to your problems. That makes it a very challenging thing for everyone. It sometimes makes it very uninteresting. But if you take it this course, this course starts from the problem. And it says, so I introduce the course only with four cardinal problems. First problem is called spirituality and workplace. Do you need spirituality in a workplace is a question people ask. And then we get dip into Bhagavad Gita and actually try to argue why do we need spirituality in workplace. The second pillar of discussion in this course is leadership. With all our journey in leadership, leadership is still a, you know, a vacuum. So we have wonderful ideas in Bhagavad Gita. We bring and discuss them on what I call it as inspirational leadership that we get from Bhagavad Gita. The third pillar that they, I talk about in this course is work. Work creates a lot of challenges for us. We go to the office, come back. There are a lot of things that happens to us. We are affected by the work. We are affected by the outcomes of the work and so on. So people actually relate to these ideas. So we talk about how has Bhagavad Gita approached the whole notion of work. So very beautifully, we discuss Karma Yoga from this lens. Then comes the fourth pillar called individual psychology. Who am I and how do I become part of an organization? How do I become part of an, a social organization, a, a family unit? And how do I contribute and where am I? So we take individual psychology and also discuss it through Gita. So the charm of this course is you walk from the problem and then say, here is a problem. Does Gita has an answer for it? And I am able to get 200 shlokas out of 700 in its original form. So I don't talk about Gita. I talk Gita. 
I bring the 200 shlokas and show that how this shloka addresses either psychology or work or leadership and so on. So that's why this course is uh, sort of very popular among my students. I, it only shows that if we are able to do that kind of, uh, take that kind of a lens and then dip into our uh, IKS, we can very beautifully bring a lot of interesting ideas into the classroom for today's problems. For today's solutions, it's very much uh, doable is my personal experience. Right. Thank you, Professor Mahadevan. I think uh, our viewers are waiting to ask you a lot of questions. I'm getting some questions in the inbox and a lot on the chats also. Thank you so much, Professor Mahadevan. I'm quite early in my journey in trying to understand the Indian knowledge systems. And what I have seen so far is there are obviously the Vedas, then there are the Nastika Darshanas. And I've gotten a little bit confused because some people say Vedas are the only true source of knowledge. Then there are saying, but Nastika Darshanas do not accept them as the authority, but that is included in Sanatana Dharma. So my question <laughs> Your understanding of Indian knowledge systems in and its practical application, are the Nastika Darshanas and others outside of Vedas included? Okay, so uh, there is this, this, this word Astika Darshana and Nastika Darshana is a technical sort of a definition. Asti, Asti means is there, Nasti means not there. So the Astika Darshana comes from the verb Asti. And the Nastika Darshana comes from the word Nasti, Nasti. Okay, so you know that's the sort of etymology if I have to use the word. So essentially, what it means is there are six darshanas. You have uh, you know Nyaya and Vaisheshika one pair, Yoga and Sankhya another pair, and Purva Mimamsa and Uttara Mimamsa another pair. These six are called Astika Darshanas. Astika Darshanas does not mean they believe in God. In fact, Sankhya does not uh, even recognize the existence of a God actually. And so is Purva Mimamsa. It's not about God. Astika Darshana means that these six schools of philosophy owe their allegiance to the Vedic corpus. Nast by contrast, Nastika Darshana means, you know, popular among them are three. Two are very popular. The third one is also there. The Jaina, the Buddha and the Charvaka. These are the three popular Nastika Darshanas, all that they are saying is we don't owe allegiance to the tenets contained in Veda. So the, there ends the, you know, the difference between these two. But if you ask, do they have valuable information? Do they uh, discuss ideas the way? I, of course, they are absolutely parallel. They are absolutely parallel. They have taken a certain assumption with which they have looked at, and therefore. Uh, we have a very good literature in Buddha uh, uh, Darshana, Bauddha Darshana, Jaina Darshana. Of course, Charvaka Darshana has a certain perspective which many have not agreed because there is a bit of illogical things that are there. But nevertheless, there are interesting ideas from there also we have taken. I think as a culture in this, in this Sanatana Dharma, we have always believed that thousand flowers must blossom. So I think uh, people are perfectly fine to uh, sort of uh, take a certain set of assumptions and then propose their uh, thought and reasoning. And we had a nice mechanism by which we can argue and agree to a portion of it and disagree to a portion of it. We had always had this healthy, healthy culture of uh, Tarka. Therefore, Bauddha Darshana, Jaina Darshana has a lot of mathematics. In Buddha Darshana, Bauddha Darshana also we have mathematics. We have ideas on shipbuilding, Jataka tales, we find things like maritime and so on. So I think all these are uh, there. I don't think uh, we need to say only, you know, Vedic corpus has all these. Of course, Sanatana Dharma largely drew, as I already explained, from the Vedic corpus, it owed allegiance to it. But uh, we have the other darshanas. Much later, we have the Sikh and uh, the Sikh, uh, you know, uh, darshana. Uh, all the religions also are very parallel to it. So that's, I think, uh, have been a very healthy coexistence of all these faiths and thoughts. And namaste, uh, Professor Mahadevan. Uh, thank you very much uh, for great, great knowledge and insights. 
I do wish your course, which you talked about, the elective uh, in IIM was open to everyone. It sounds really, really interesting. Thank you once again for this great work that you're doing, which is much needed. My question, sir, is actually more um, with regard to the future. So we, we know that a lot of work is underway with regard to our curriculum overhaul and everything like that. And you might be in the know of certain things. The concern here, sir, is that these are very complex issues to get into. And because there is a caste dimension as well involved, when you're talking IKS, when we're talking Vedas and Shastras, and you know, even if we want to put in chants, uh, for example, sacred chants in a school, you know, th there will be an opposition to it. And unfortunately, education being a state subject. So how do you think all this, which does need to go in, all that you have discussed today and enlightened us about, has to go in to be taught as How are we going to make this happen? So it is more a question in a um, practical. Yeah. So uh, this is a very important point that you have raised, Deepanjali ji. Thank you for this. Uh, there are a few things I want to say, a few analogies. Then we will know the gravity of the problem. Suppose you take a... You know, 100,000 rupee, 1 lakh rupee worth silk sari and threw it onto your thumb. Now the question is, how do you take it out? You know, you can't pull it just like that. It will all tear and then the whole thing is gone. 1 lakh worth of piece is gone. So what we do, what do we do? We very, very carefully, we put our hand, you know, maybe one thumb is a little easier to give up. So we remove 2 millimeter of space from there. Then we look around, oh, here is this another place where we, it seems to be a little easier, we will pull. So I think uh, we will have to take that kind of an approach. We have created a discontinuity for 200 years and therefore we are having a re-entry problem now. So it is a re-entry strategy that we have to work out. Let us be very realistic about it, first of all. As you say, anything that you say, we will shoot ourselves because we ourselves don't know. We have been completely brainwashed into something else. Let us not talk about why it happened and all that is history. Let us not waste our time on it. So first of all, I think uh, it is very important that we need patience. We need to you know, take one step at a time. And then uh, this is point number one. Point number two, I'll give you another analogy. If I have to go to Mount Everest, I would never bother about Mount Everest. I will bother about the first base camp. That's all is my worry now. If I really want to go to Mount Everest, that's what I will do. I will try to understand where is the first base camp, what are the nuances of reaching that base camp, what are all the skills and training that you need to have to reach that base camp, I will work on it. Once I go to the first base camp, I will now say where is the second base camp. Maybe the 11th base camp is uh, Mount Everest. So again, we need to do that approach here. We need to understand that we have a problem on hand. And so it's not that, you know, we'll throw everything on the other side. I, all those don't work like that. So we need to work one at a time. So let us lay our hands on the school education and say what we need to do. So, you know, this uh, book is a step in that. You know, can you bring it back and let people start? Not everybody is going to accept. Not everybody is going to take it just like that. And we don't have to even worry about it. Force it down somebody's throat. All that we don't have to do. This is the second part. Now, while we do all these, there are very important governing principles that we have to keep in mind. Principle number one, let us not glorify the past. There's absolutely no need to, I, this is my personal experience. Even when I offered the course here, I never want to say this is great because you don't have to say. If the ideas are very intuitive, the ideas are very appealing, nobody can stop. It. So therefore, we need to be very clear what we want to do. Because this is one mistake I find in the anxiety to bring it back. We want to say it has everything. I'll give you an example. Sometimes it clarifies better. You know, there is one shloka in Bhagavad Gita, in chapter 7. There is a shloka 7, which says, Matta parataram na anyat kinchidasti dananjaya, mai sarvamitam protam sutre manigana iva. It's a beautiful shloka. It says it is like a long thread in which uh, there are a lot of different shapes and colored beads or even one after the other. I mean, Krishna is explaining something that. So I have found people who are saying that string theory is explained in Bhagavad Gita because there is a word string. The only common thing is there is a word string. Sutre manigana even. There is a sutra and there are maniganas. We should not do all those. I think we'll do a great damage by doing that. It's not required. So we should not glorify the past. There is no anxiety to do all that. We should bring very sensible. I find most of these pieces 
most of this text in its original format is very sensible if you have a very neutral lens and then dip into it and see the charm of what is it and then bring it second guiding principle you should not rely excessively on translated work especially by the foreigners because they however genuinely interested they are there is a certain limitation they have because they have not lived in the culture they cannot take it again let me give you an example there is a great philosopher a dutch philosopher who translated a work called shatapata brahmana and in one of the shloka i have given it in my book actually as an example in one of the shloka he translates the shloka as follows the earth the, the earth is separated from the heavenly bodies by stacking thousand cows one over the other i mean it's the most laughable you and i will laugh at it how do you stack thousand cows one over the other and then he says the earth is separated from the heavenly body you know what he has done he has translated the sanskrit words faithfully he says sahasra gavaha that is in the mantra go means cow but if you read what is called nirukta which is very required to understand veda there are 38 different meanings for the word gau and one of them is the earth itself so actually an interpretation is the diameter to distance ratio is actually 100 times that is explained in that mantra actually but then you know he has uh, unwittingly translated by saying you stack 1000 cows one over the other other you separate the earth from the heavenly so these kinds of challenges we have to be very very careful we should invest very carefully this is the second guiding principle and what comes out of it is the third guiding principle never teach anesthesia when you are a expert in chemistry you have to understand it people teach indian knowledge system without reading please in, we, we i mean this is a, a requirement for us to be a patriotic person please invest it will take 10 years let it took 30 years for me i have read in the last 30 years very seriously so i always say that don't be a expert in chemistry and teach anesthesia if you want to teach anesthesia learn a little bit of anesthesia before you teach if you follow these guiding principles and these analogies it will take 20 30 years let it take we have lost only 200 years in 20 30 years we can come back and then and by its own merit of the charm of the literature it will get acceptance not because you taught and i taught and so on the literature is good if you can bring it rightly then we could solve the problem i think i have been very long in this answer bear with me for it thank you professor mahadevan for everybody there is a chinmaya channel on youtube where professor mahadevan's lectures are available and insights uh, on management management paradigms from bhagavad gita you have that of course is a different course in i am bangalore but his lectures are available on the channel chinmaya channel you can search for it and also uh, on the iimb website there are his writings there which one can explore namaste professor vadivan first of all i'm really sorry i couldn't attend uh, the initial part of the conversation so probably my question would be a repeated one and even though tanya ji has already partly answered the question but uh, being a management student myself i would still have to ask that so i recently completed my mba and uh, the idea of paradigm management paradigm and bhagavad gita never really crossed my mind ever and uh, right now i'm really uh, after listening to you i'm very fascinated and actually trying to find out if there's a way to learn it from you in person other than the youtube uh, lectures or mm-hmm. um, all the available means on the internet is there any way to learn it from you probably virtually or in person the course well i uh, first of all uh, there are is there is some material available uh, you know in addition to what uh, tanya ji mentioned there is one youtube channel called practical vedanta samvada i have about maybe 600 videos there i've been whatever i've been doing in the last uh, there are different facets of iks uh, which i talk which appeals to you and me today as youngsters and uh, going through a certain kind of issues and so on so practical vedanta samvada is another youtube channel and i have a youtube channel of b mahadevan so all these that's one part i have uh, a book called uh, a, you know on bhagavad gita it's called uh, timeless gift and uh, endless bliss 
the first six chapters of Bhagavad Gita I have written. It is available, I think, in Amazon. It is available in Poti. I have self-published this book. So in addition to all this writing, uh, to answer to you, Shruti, I also, this practical way, Vedanta Samvada is a weekly kind of a satsang. Anybody is free to join there and be part of those lectures on a real-time mode and so on. If you're interested, you can always, uh, you know, search for it and then find me there and be part of it in YouTube or in Zoom or whatever. Good morning to you and uh, thank you, Professor Saab. And thank you, Sangam Talk, for bringing such a beautiful talk. It was indeed enlightening and a big learning for me. Uh, we are running an organization by the name of the Proud Veterans Sir. And uh, we are in touch with the USI, that is the oldest think tank of Asia. And we intend rolling out a small a strategic leadership program for various universities. I am already in touch with two of the IIMs who have in principle okayed the program. So in this program, we intend to cover the art of long strategic view, the comprehensive national security, development of strategic leadership, and so on. So my question comes to brief mention of Mahabharata and how Mahabharata can be a dovetailed with this program. So if it would be okay, I would take your uh, email ID and your contact details from Dr. Rinku Vadera. And I'll further develop on this if in case we can include this subject as part of the strategic leadership program. Thank you so much. Sir. Thank you. Yeah, we'll do whatever is possible. Thank you. What is the low consumption principle in the Jain philosophy? If the good professor will like well, uh, I must tell you, I haven't uh, read, uh, you know, read very extensively on it. So, therefore, uh, I would be very guarded in my response. But uh, in whatever little uh, I have understood, I think uh, the, the fundamental theme there is one of uh, sustainability. Mean, today, we talk so much about sustainability, actually, right? We talk about sustainability. In fact, the, the common thread I see between Sanatan Dharma and the Jaina Dharma and the Bauddha Dharma, if you ask, is this very word Dharma. See, the word Sanskrit word Dharma has come from Sanskrit root called Dhru. Dhru, Dhru, Dhru is the root actually. Dhru Dharane, Dhru Dharane. That is the way. The nearest definition of this Dhatu Dhru is called, is actually support or behold or sustain. In fact, in Mahabharata, there is a beautiful conversation in Karna Parva where it is formally defined. It says, Dharana Dharma Ityaguhu, Dharmo Dharete Jagat, Yat Dharana Sanyuktam, Saha Dharma Iti Nishchitah. Krishna says, Do you know how to establish what is called Dharma? It says, Only such things that we can engage in which has its basic propensity to sustain. So all these modern words of sustainability that we are talking about, you know, climatic sustainability, you know, social sustainability, all of them weave into this dharma. And the question is exactly, so the low consumption and the, all these that we are talking about in Jaina dharma is actually entrenching deeply this concept of dharma. How do we live in a very sustainable world is a profound thought, not just ancient Indians. Let me tell you, all ancient traditions had it. Just because I knew a little bit of Indian knowledge, I'm using examples from there. But the ancient traditions were very, very parallel in this thinking. That unless you coexist with the living and non-living entities, it's not going to be a very interesting world for us. I think they had that wisdom. Somewhere in our jet-setting style, we are reinventing it the hard way. Uh, just one question and a couple of comments. How critical is the uh, knowledge of Sanskrit in individuals? How critical is it for the revival of Indian knowledge systems as a living discipline, as opposed to a historical discipline? Because related to this, there is a slightly different view that you know, we have sort of lost most of Sanskrit and we are going to lose even more. So the better solution would be to do some kind of a emergency procedure in which you use Sanskrit untranslatables, which is what Raji Manodra calls it, and incorporate that into English with the proviso that, you know, 
it is not exactly translatable and we have to understand several layers of meanings so this is my question very good it's a very good question i have only one line answer for you if you want to enjoy raja ravi verma's painting don't look at a photocopy of that look at the original painting because the photocopy will give you the substance but the spirit will be lost to a large extent so therefore uh, keeping away sanskrit is a second best solution I mean, that's the only way to go forward which i don't think uh, is uh, the way to go but uh, if that's the only way to go no it is a bandage operation that we have to do i mean i i have a lot of respect for rajiv ji malhotra ji i agree they are all you know as you said emergency procedure and intermediate solution we have a profound solution in our hand we if we know how to re bring sanskrit back i used to teach a three credit course in iim bangalore called introduction to sanskrit language 50 students will take it after me bhagavad gita course they will tell me sir please teach sanskrit it's so interesting what you are talking i have taught that course here also i think uh, if we work backwards and say how to introduce sanskrit people will pick it uh, at a great uh, speed and in a matter of 20 years we will be able to use sanskrit we don't want to be a pandit nobody wants to be ashukavi in sanskrit but we want to use sanskrit as we use english see i i learn english not because i want to become one more shakespeare i am not going to be a literary giant in english but i want english because i can consume the whole literature that is there in english so the same approach we can easily get into sanskrit but to use uh, non translatables and all that is all well, via media solution it's like looking at raja ravi verma's painting in black and white i would like to love to see it in its original form which is in beautiful you know uh, color etched on leather or whatever thank you professor mahadevan uh, we are getting a lot of compliments for this talk and uh, all our audience members have loved uh, this interview and we will try to get you they want you back on sangam talks on your other books uh, very soon so we'll try to squeeze out some time from your schedule in the future as well uh, namaste professor mahadevan i just want to thank you i wrote an email to you i don't know if you remember i learned the whole taktriya upanishad from your lectures 50 plus hours of lectures on taktriya upanishad and uh, the clarity it gave me the initiation it gave me into the upanishadic literature so thank you very much i just wanted to thank you and uh, you are one rare person i have never disagreed on anything you know whatever you say i tend to agree i usually disagree very easily with most people but i completely agree so if i can be of any help in doing what you are doing i it will be my good fortune thank you so much thank you anuradha ji i think it has been your magnanimity to praise me like this uh, it's uh, i take it uh, with folded hands i don't think all that you said is true but i am very happy that uh, you could uh, really benefit a little bit from some of my thoughts thank you very much thank you anuradha ji also anuradha ji could you just uh, for the for the knowledge of our audience members let us know on which channel or from where you uh, learned the tetriya upanishad it is on the imb channel i think no it is part of that practical vedanta samvada which i mentioned in fact there is I... an imb channel sir on that you have these 55 lectures on tetriya upanishad Yes, <laughs> very true. Uh, this cross linked in my home page. You are right. Okay, thank you so much, Anuradha Ji. So, for all our audience members, there is the I M Bangalore channel on YouTube, in which you can find Professor Mahadevan's lectures on the Upanishads, as Anuradha Ji said, and it's been extremely beneficial for her. I am sure it will be for all of us. Actually, this is not a question. This is a sort of point of disagreement with uh, what Professor Mahadevan said. especially regarding the sustainability issue and all that so uh, my understanding is that uh, you know there are lots of great values embedded in our scriptures and everything that are useful in the contemporary world there is no doubt about it but the idea of sustainability and other things and especially environmental protection is rather recent because uh, the ancient people whoever they are all the ancient civilizations never had a clear idea of the finitude that is uh, of nature that is they did not realize that the natural resources are actually finite because they were probably not extracting it at the rate 
that uh, people in the industrial society does and uh, therefore you know they just could not do much but even in spite of that if you look historic at the historical record so many animals have gone extinct through simple hunting with bows and arrows for instance the rhinoceros covered almost all of northwestern india and most of it was gone even in uh, pre uh, musket times so uh, similarly the aurochs in uh, europe and all those things so i think it's one thing to re revere nature and respect it and even set aside sacred groves but it is quite another to understand that it is in essence finite so uh, i think uh, we need to nuance this discussion a little bit that's all thank you ramakrishnan ji uh, you may benefit from reading certain important suktas in uh, rigveda i can even also tell you if you look at the vastu texts you know cutting a tree is uh, not easy in our tradition there are there are enough indications see one of the thing that happens in indian knowledge system is nothing is available explicit there is lot of sukshma in the way we describe everything it is not available on the surface so i am not sure you may want to read a little bit on uh, some of the particularly rigvedic suktas and i find even in uh, vastu text i get a feeling they were absolutely clear about the criticality and finiteness of nature and they have been very careful about uh, how do you go about uh, exploiting it it may be a different issue that the rate at which they exploited may not have reached them to what we have reached today it may be that anyway you may want to check on that i, I will leave it at that i don't uh, have to uh, you know disagree with you maybe you may want to check some of these uh, issues in a little more detail Namaste. Uh, I just had a small comment. Uh, the gentleman who said that the uh, e ancient people did not uh, were actually not extracting uh, that way because they did not know. But the thing is, from what I have read in my readings, I felt that in our uh, dharma sutra suktas and everywhere in the practices. people knew that is why the rules of limiting your usage was applied so that everybody gets it and we do not run out of resources and there were various practices in that is my understanding in <coughs> our daily life uh, that uh, were applied so that we do not over extract from the nature and our sustainable fuel like using gobar for fuel and all i think that is what they did and we are not understanding that part yeah thank you punam ji actually uh, you know i in one of the international yoga day 2017 i was in paris the government of india asked me to go to paris and uh, the entire lecture was on sustainability and i did not have to go beyond four shlokas in chapter 3 of bhagavad gita shloka 3.10 to 3.14 i also written about it i know if you carefully look at all those uh, our ancestors understanding of uh, criticality of uh, sustainability and finiteness of nature was very evident actually i mean at least that's the way i have understood so maybe we can look at all that uh, little more deeply thank you sangam talks thank you dr rinku ji for uh, giving me an opportunity i thoroughly enjoyed it thank you very much thank you thank you so much